Um, I'll, I'll try to say some words in, uh, for Alex uh, because I sort of, I think Alex was sort of really responsible for a lot of things, I, uh, well, like decisions or uh, sort of routes I decided to make in my uh, professional sort of life. Uh, but I will try, I will say it in Hebrew, I'm sorry. <laughs> בגדול סתם, זאת אומרת, חשבתי כאילו מה, איך לתאר כאילו את אלכס בגדול, ככה כמה שיותר מהר, ונזכרתי באותם דקות שהיינו מסיימים פגישה, והיו איזה שתי דקות שהוא היה אומר, אני מלווה אתכם עכשיו לדלת. ובתוך השתי דקות האלה, בתכלס קרה כל מה שיכל לקרות עם אלכס. זה היה מתחיל ב... מה שלומך, מה שלום ההורים שלך, מה שלום, מה שלום אחותך, מה שלום הבעל של אחותך, מה שלום, מה שלום האחיינית שלך והאחיין שלך, והוא היה יודע הכל על כולם. ואז מתוך איזה פינה, איזה בן אדם רנדומלי שהחליף מנורה למעלה, הוא היה פתאום שואל אותו, אז מה שלומך ומה שלום אבא שלך ומה שלום אחותך ומה שלום זה, זאת אומרת, והוא היה יודע הכל, ושני הדברים האלה כאילו קורים בערך בו זמנית. ותוך שנייה הוא היה רואה איזה משהו על הרצפה, איזה חתיכת זבל, הוא היה מיד מרים את זה. מחפש פח, זורק את זה בפח, בתוך הפח הוא היה מוצא איזשהו אובייקט, היה מוציא את האובייקט ואומר וואו, זה האובייקט הכי מדהים שאפשר, שאפשר למצוא כאן, כאילו הדבר הזה צריך להיות באוסף. ובזמן שהוא מדבר על האוסף הוא פתאום שולף ספר מהכיס, כמו איזה קוסם, ואומר, כן זה מאוד מזכיר את הבן אדם הזה שהיה במקום הזה ואתה חייב לראות את זה ומתחיל לדפדף בספר ואומר לך, אז מה דעתך על זה? ומה דעתך על זה? ומה דעתך על זה? ובתוך כל הסביבה הזאת איכשהו חוזר לזה ש... אז אולי תראה, תראה גם לאבא שלך את הדבר הזה, ואולי גם ל... זאת אומרת, ואיכשהו כל הדברים האלה התנגסו ביחד לתוך איזה שתי דקות קסומות כאלה, שאתה מדבר על הדברים הכי אישיים, הדברים הכי פרטיים, העיצוב נכנס באמצע, ו... ואין שום הבדל בין... אין שום הבדל בין מה שקורה בין החיים המקצועיים שלך למה שקורה לך בחיים, למה שקורה מסביבך, ובאיזשהו מקום נראה לי שהשתי דקות האלה זה איזשהו מיצוי של ה... לא, ש... איך שאני ראיתי אותו לפחות, של להצליח לעשות משהו כשאתה רואה את הכל. וזהו, וחבל לי מאוד, כאילו, שאלכס בתכלס, שזה ש... כל כך כאילו גם תמך, נראה לי תמך בי כאילו, פשוט לא פה. זהו, אז אני, עם זה אני אנסה לעבור לדברים הבאים. So basically, I, uh, I'm coming from a graphic design background. Uh, it's my, I did some books, I did a lot of books, I think. Uh, some pieces for my final project where I sort of uh, deal with, dealt with the music. and graphic design. Then I met uh, Noah Schwartz, and we opened a, a shared studio together, did books for artists, for designers, museums, exhibitions. This is a book we did with Alex for the collection. Design for Change with Alex. Some of the books you might know, but I think probably most of them no one actually heard about. So, I think after six years, I sort of uh, got into a crisis. Uh, so I think I had the usual sort of graphic design crisis that everything looked the same, I'm doing the same thing, I'm working for customers, blah, 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 blah. Uh, what am I going to be when I'm going to grow old? I'm going to just have another studio and that's it. This is how my life's going to end. I was, I was really sort of into this, uh, into this crisis. And of course, Alex, in a few minutes, just told me, eh, forget about the thing. You just have to go see, see the world, basically. Um, and... He sort of really uh, directed me to this uh, amazing department in the RCA, uh, Design Interactions, when I also met Norm. Um, and I started uh, sort of, I came there with a lot of uh, frustration about the, the place I'm sort of uh, working in. And I had this thing of kind of looking around and seeing, you know, what's happening with books, that instead of, you know, we used to burn books because they were not allowed, they were kind of making a... 
problems conceptually. And now we're sort of just using them as, you know, decoration objects. This is things that you just see every day in uh, London, uh, sort of like high street shops. You get books in, inside magazines as a present. And I think one of the most ridiculous thing I saw, uh, I think a few years ago, was this uh, writer that decided to write her own book within a book, uh, within a bookstore um, window. So that's her sitting, talking in the phone, supposedly writing her new novel. <laughs> the second thing I was really sort of uh, realizing is that basically for the last past 100 years, graphic designer were basically adapting themselves to the technology and they never uh, was actually thinking about what technology do we need, why, because we're doing, you know, we're coming from graphic design, what does it mean, what do we need for this thing or what do we need to develop for this thing. So basically this is sort of just an illustration of, you know, how graphic design looked for me. Um, uh, and through my first year I had this chance of uh, doing a sort of a design research with the Microsoft Research in Cambridge called The Future of Writing. And I'm not going to get into the project, but in the end of the project, basically, I came up with this notion that if I don't know how to answer those questions, like why do we actually write, why do we read, and those sort of supposedly were supposed to be my, uh, you know, the question that graphic designers or book designers are supposed to, you know, supposed to have some answers about them. So if I don't know the answers, I should maybe kind of consider, uh, reconsider what I'm doing uh, until I, you know, have a, a bit of a something about those things. Uh, and I found this really nice quote that says, uh, from the guy who ran uh, CERN in the beginning, uh, who says that it doesn't matter how much R&D you're going to do on a candle, you're never going to go to electricity from there. So I sort of, I think I took this approach and I, saw, I said, enough books, I'm trying to move on in order to sort of find something interesting about it. Uh, and my, I think my last project uh, kind of relating, related to book, uh, I had a, a brief uh, called Design Philanthropy, and I found this library uh, in Lambeth, in London. They were having trouble because the council was uh, sort of threatening them to, uh, to close them because they were a really small library. They only had like a few uh, sort of new books just from recent years. Uh, and I thought about why not making a machine that will give those books history that will actually make them old. So I came up with this uh, book aging machine. This is some experiments I did before, kind of trying to, you know, how to, uh, how to make paper old, how to uh, trade those things. And I found up uh, a nice system that I will show you in this. So basically that was the machine. There's like a UV light inside, which is like sunlight and humidity. And you just turn, on, uh, turn off the, the pages, and every, uh, every hour basically equals to four, I think four days, or it was the opposite, I really don't remember. But that was the, that was the idea. So basically, after one week, you get, a, you get a book that is probably 100 years old in his look. And for me, that was a sort of a, sort of a playful, critical thing about the, the place I'm, you know, I'm coming from. And the nice thing, I mean, for me, was when I showed this thing, it got uh, sort of got published, by, basically uh, published in, in Frame magazine in a context of other sort of designers making their own technology pr to produce products. And I think that was the first time I sort of felt comfortable or felt that I'm, I'm maybe I'm sort of finally moving on from the place that I was, I was in. And then in my, um, in my first year, basically, uh, I got this brief to uh, deal with something called synthetic biology. So synthetic biology is all about basically uh, having an engineering uh, approach to genetics, which means you have small components, you put them together in circuits, and you get something that works or doing something. And the idea is you have genes, you have different sort of promoters, you have a starting point, an end point, everything, you put them together, you create like a, a, this thing will create this protein, this thing will create this material. You design everything in a digital environment and in the end you just order, um, order like bacteria, DNA, everything you, uh, you decide you wanna test. And one of the most, uh, I think, recent uh, famous 
sort of known uh, project was this uh, Glowing uh, Trees uh, Kickstarter project, which basically a guy used uh, a shareware, like a free software, uh, developed by an Israeli company called Genome Compiler, uh, to actually sell a new product, like a new sort of uh, synthesized uh, product with uh, this glowing uh, protein, uh, to have trees uh, around us that glows. Uh, and this thing, this sort of um, crowdsource, free uh, DIY thing, is like re getting sort of really, really, uh, getting to be part of the synthetic biology sort of uh, environment. And one really nice uh, example was this, this uh, nice kid here in 2009 was part of a MIT uh, competition, uh, really sort of established competition called iGEM, uh, and he developed a DNA synthesizer from Lego, which is, I think is like really amazing uh, achievement for a uh, 11 years uh, old kid. Um, and when you look at sort of, you know, the cultural, or sort of, uh, cultural interaction basically, or uh, the way we sort of want you know, the world around us to be. You get those nice uh, dogs, I think those from China, uh, they just dye hair them, so to make, to make them look like a tiger, to make them look like a panda, but basically it's, it's just a pure breed uh, dog, uh, which people would really like to see them as something else. And when scientists are starting to work on really uh, bizarre projects like glowing cats, and glowing monkeys. Actually, this is a few generation of glowing monkeys, so they actually pass the gene to the next generation, staying glow, uh, like still uh, keeping the glowing thing sort of trait within them. Um, there's a nice experiment uh, from the 50s with this uh, Russian scientist uh, called Dmitry Belayev. Uh, I'm probably not saying it right. Uh, but what he did was sort of uh, trying to see uh, how, we got to, how we got into dogs, basically, from wild animals. And he took those wild foxes, Siberian foxes, which were really angry and vicious. Every generation, he, t he picked up just the nicest one and started breeding the nicest one and got a new generation of really cute foxes that you can hug and play with, and they're not going to bite you, or not going to do anything else. And in a way, that's sort of making nature sort of just fulfilling a, sort of a human, maybe a psychological sort of a, a need that we have. So I took this idea of uh, making the, psycho kind of trying to get some psychological needs from nature, basically, uh, through synthetic biology. And I, um, I thought this thing about sort of poetic genes. I mean, if there's a possibility of actually uh, infusing stories, like uh, stories that we tell every day, into uh, animals. Um, so apparently this, the, the process is actually feasible. Uh, and I decided to take uh, just a few memories of my uh, grandfather, which I didn't know. Uh, things from his childhood, his family, try to sort of look at the, you know, the traits, if he was intolerant, if he was a pessimist and anxious. And apparently there are genes for each one, or this is what they say, or this is what they tell us. Uh, and what will happen if we're gonna put all those traits into a mouse, basically a transgenic mouse, a mouse model. And then the only thing that we'll, I would really like to have is basically looking at my grandfather sort of operating, you know, through his life. So I designed this uh, sort of system, uh, which looked like this. This cage just sort of goes through his childhood, through different sort of phases in his life, with a mouse model that has my grandfather's genes. And the aesthetic, of course, was sort of uh, coming from the period he was uh, living in. And this is the end of his life. So what I did in my second year in my uh, final project was actually taking this project, uh, this really sm tiny project, into the real world and see what, ha what is actually happening around us. Um, so I looked at what sort of genetic services are actually accessible to us as, as public, what we can actually, you know, just put our credit card in and uh, start, uh, start working it out. So 
a year ago, uh, I think almost two years ago, basically, Google 23andMe, which is uh, just a gene sequencing uh, um, service, uh, started to be like a really uh, like a big hit. Uh, also around it, there was uh, a lot of uh, for, uh, services that offered uh, forensic tests. So basically, you can get someone else's genes, send it to a lab, and get it sequenced, get his genes uh, mapped. And another thing I discovered that the transgenic mice were uh, actually a service that was open to, to the public. They didn't pay attention to the, the idea that they, uh, they were unethical and they have to uh, um, kind of close it uh, to science, to the lab. And you get those uh, things, kind of uh, mice that are tailored for your needs. So basically you can choose any genes you want and just put them in the mouse. Um, so the second phase was, okay, so Whose life do I actually people would like to see? Um, and the second thing would how can I get these genes? And my answer was eBay. So apparently in eBay there are like uh, really huge uh, celebrities, pre-owned items, uh, sort of culture going around. So you can get like T-shirts of Pamela Anderson with some sweat uh, sweat stains. You can get letters sent from like famous prisoners, like I don't know, from El Capone to uh, the Craig Craig brothers, and of course you get hairs of uh, all the celebrities you can ask for, and the three of those apparently were the most popular one, uh, three uh, guys and a lady uh, who died before their, ti their time, and apparently there's and you know how I see it is basically that we we would really like to have them alive, kind of just looking at the end of their, uh, you know, what would have happened if. So I bought the hairs of three of them. This is the hairs of, uh, the hair of Elvis Presley I bought on eBay. Uh, it cost something around $25. You get this certificate from his barber uh, with a sample, uh, with a signature, uh, that this is Elvis Presley's hair. And then, I had to do a proof of concept, so I contacted the, those two scientists I was working in uh, in the summer with uh, on one of the iGEM projects in Imperial College. Uh, from certain reason, I can't show their faces and tell their names. I'll get into it. Uh, and we did this proof of concept. We just took one of the scientists' hair. Uh, we tried to uh, look up for a, a gene called Actin3, which is uh, the athlete gene. And of course, uh, we found out that the scientist doesn't have the athlete genes, surprisingly. Uh, so what it means, basically, that if a mouse will have this gene, So a really important experiment. Yeah, so that's, the, so that's the thing. That's the sort of translation that you can get from uh, different traits. Um, so I got into the design project. So I have the mouse, I have, the, I have Elvis's hair, I have the mouse that contain Elvis's genes. Uh, now I have to create Elvis's life. How would, could we, you know, kind of take a look at Elvis's life? So I looked a lot of in different biographies of Elvis. And from the other hand, I looked about, uh, on uh, some scientific models, uh, behavioristic models uh, of mice, and I got this amazing book, uh, What Happened to My Mouse, which is the Bible of behavioristic science, uh, apparently. Uh, so I think for a few weeks, I was going around with all those uh, crazy experiments, some deals with anxiety, some sort of deals with uh, threatening mice, some really incredible and horrible um, uh, situations that you can, you know, put a mouse into. Uh, and I try to sort of pick up some of Elvis's uh, parts, looking at, you know, what, what made, you know, what made him as a child, what, what he, he, did he actually went through. Um, and I came up with those six models. Uh, his childhood, one that talks about the, the, his talent, one sort of talks about uh, his self-image, how he gets bigger and bigger in time, kind of looking at himself. One was uh, uh, the Graceland, which every place he, uh, which he got a lot of sort of positive uh, uh, reinforcement, uh, a re self-reflection period, and in the end, uh, the escaping, escaping life. Uh, I don't have the, the video, but basically, 
there's a video <laughs> illustrating all of those uh, all of those models. Basically, what happens in there? I mean, how how do they treat him? What do we ha what do we have he have to he have to do? Sorry. And, uh, and regarding the design, I thought of a, a system that would be sort of a modular system that you can actually tweak and change to, you know, what do you want to, the things that you would like to have or see Elvis sort of going through. So I experimented a lot with the, the materials from those cages, which was metal, and I came up with this really simple uh, sort of modular system and started constructing the, the cages. I looked a bit of uh, uh, into Elvis, into Graceland, basically, uh, to take some samples of how this thing should actually be. And this is the project. So those are the over there on the frames, the the real hairs, and there's the the tower would basically go from his childhood to his death. Everything is sort of with small electronics, opens things, sounds, and different. Those were the mice I showed, uh, sort of just to illustrate the, the idea of, you know, having one model and having another model and having another model and testing their lives. Some details. This is Graceland. And the end. So that was the project, uh, but the most interesting part of the project, I think, uh, was the things that happened after the project. Um, so at the beginning, I was really happy. Everything was really nice. I got uh, noticed by uh, this kind of uh, design-related, art-related uh, places. I was really, really happy. Everything was, I couldn't ask for more. And then, I got this uh, email from Wired magazine, which basically asked me to um, to give them examples of those services that I was using. Uh, I didn't pay attention to this warning sign that I felt uncomfortable with, and then they actually they published the uh, the project as if I actually went and uh, did those mice. So there are actually mice with Elvis presses with jean, jeans. Uh, and when I first saw this thing, I was really, really afraid. I uh, sort of went through, there, was, <laughs> there were two, uh, basically two guys that were trying to uh, sort of consult with. The one, one approach told me, uh, eh, forget about it. It's like uh, newspapers, everything, they just distorted all the facts. Don't worry about it, everything's gonna be fine, just keep on going. The other one said everything might fall down in a second. And while I was sort of thinking, what should I do, uh, this thing got really bizarre. So people, Elvis's fans, just newspapers, uh, it was, was one of, uh, I think, one of the 15, I, I don't remember, like, what, like a really huge hit on MSN, um, Scientific American, like all the, it, it was really sort of um, got out of hand. And, at the same time, I think it was the same week or two weeks afterwards, uh, Madonna suddenly came, there was this uh, thing when Madonna appointed the DNA team to sterilize her dressing room after she used it. So suddenly everything came together and, oh, Madonna's doing it, I got Elvis, basically, yeah, that's it. And I was invited to uh, this, uh, um, uh, doesn't matter, go back, uh, we'll go to the more interesting uh, parts. Uh, I think the most, the nicest email I got uh, in this period of time was uh, from a company that actually wanted me to sell them the clones, and it's uh, to to start producing them in the U in the U.S. Of course, um, so I'm fascinated by your exper experimental experimental design as well as the overall goals of your experiment. Uh, so he treats me as a scientist. Uh, if you and your colleagues were at any point planning for sell, to sell those uh, mice to the general public, um, other laboratories in the near future, if so, what would be the cost for said rodents? So that was like, I think, a fantastic thing that sort of really uh, showed uh, how people really want those things. Um, 
Back to reality, I was uh, basically, um, Imperial College was threatened by, <laughs> by a lawsuit <laughs> uh, from the company, one of the companies that make those uh, transgenic mice uh, because they thought uh, they were actually made. So uh, I think most of the, I think the two months after I graduated, I was only doing emails uh, with the RCA PR to take off all the, all, basically all the articles that we could or change uh, or change the details. So the Daily Mail, which is like a really sort of a, um, like a yellowish, uh, not ish, yellow um, sort of a newspaper, uh, just took it off because I think they are sort of threatening, threatened by lawsuits, you know, by the hour. Uh, a nice thing that, that was, I sort of discovered a few, uh, actually just a week ago, uh, because it's, the project is shown uh, at the science gallery, so it's sort of reconstructing the whole thing again. Uh, there was a nice show, and this is sort of an example of how the sort of the general public or the yellow-ish uh, thing treats this project. Okay, Michael Moran for bringing this final story to my attention oh, on, good on, on, on Twitter. Uh, it's being reported in the Mirror online, but this would seem to be verified by like an official website. As part of a living art project, a British artist called Kobe Barhad has created a mouse British. with Elvis Presley's jeans. That's jeans with a G, G -E -N -E -S. Not, not jeans with a J, because they'd have to be very, very small jeans. Yeah. Well, you probably, they do shrink. Well, shrink <laughs> they do. So Kobe bought some of Elvis Presley's hair on eBay for about $22, extracted the DNA, sent that to a gene sequencing lab to identify different behavioral traits in the DNA, like sociability or obesity or addiction, certain things that Elvis Presley was kind of known for. Using this information, mice clones with parallel identity traits, character traits, were then produced. Now then these Elvis mice as part of this art project which is called All That I Am, these mice were housed in different scientific mouse model environments. So each environment represented a different circumstance. So in, one in a little in, Graceland. In Elvis's, well, no, one in a little Sun Studios. More behaviourally. I see. So there's one with like a curved mirror which is supposed to represent uh, self-importance and fame. There's another one with a sloping treadmill uh, which is supposed to represent I'm the singer's decline. I'm surprised this person has managed to extract key uh, signifiers of Elvis Presley's DNA so easily just by buying a bit of his hair off eBay. This sounds a a little bit. <laughs> so we cloned Elvis Presley. I'm just, I just report the news. It's a full art project. There's, there's, you can see that it's like a huge construction. This tower and each part of the tower, a different mouse with the, uh, with Elvis's DNA in it, uh, engaged in a different El Elvis Presley it, kind of environment. It's a little bit sad because one of them um, died on the toilet eating a massive peanut butter and jello sandwich, didn't he? Yeah. So that was, that was, that was the the ultimate upshot. <laughs> That is the most bizarre. I'm gonna to have to. We have to check the veracity of this because if you can really do that, then I'm I'm gonna go and buy a lock of Mark Knopfler's hair and have some what? Mark Knopfler mice what? In, <laughs> in, in, in my basement, <laughs> just all walking around with headbands, headbands. and little straps. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm gonna do. BBC Radio. Yeah. So that was the. I think the general reaction for uh, people outside. I mean. The, the, it, when it goes out of the context of design and art and uh, science, basically those are the the first basic reaction. I mean, oh yeah, I would love to have a Marilyn Monroe dog, or uh, we'll have to, yeah. So that's basically the the way people see it. Um, so um, and one for me, well, the, the the most I think important or significant thing was uh, when I was doing this thing. There was uh, it, basically all the um, this issue is basically, in, you know, in, in the beginning. Uh, and apparently uh, doing a forensic test is illegal. And one of the, the company that I mentioned in this uh, Wired article, uh, apparently uh, they, choose to, uh, they chose this company. Uh, they actually, after a few months, uh, after the, uh, the project was published, they actually took off the, this test, the service that they uh, offered, realizing it's illegal. Uh, so for me, it was a really nice, um, I think, experiment with how you can, you know, what you can achieve with just, uh, you know, with just a story that you make people sort of believe in, which could be true, but is definitely didn't go till the end. So uh, 
yeah, I think that's the end. Now I'm still sort of dealing with the uh, synthetic biology from uh, I'm taking part of this uh, research in uh, the RCA called Studio Lab, and hopefully we'll have a new work uh, that this is just a sort of a strange illustration for it, uh, I hope, in the next months. Uh, and that's it. Thank you.